You are listening to episode 26 of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. I am hiding out in my mudroom, so hopefully it doesn't sound too echoey because the acoustics in here aren't ideal, but this goes perfectly with today's topic, the reality of working at home with kids around. My name is Lisa, mom of six and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Most Americans, or a lot of Americans, I'm not really sure if it's most, have been forced into this situation by the you know what that's going around. I've been told we're not supposed to say the word. I don't know if that's true for podcasts, but it's true for the blog and the YouTube channel. That has been the recommendation from my blogger friends and just some some people who have a little bit more authority in the industry of creating content. So I like that because I have been seeing so many crazy things going around that is misinformation. And I like to read straight from actual statistics. I really try to avoid reading too much into news stories, but just mostly the statistics of what's actually happening. The actions being taken are probably going to have some pretty big consequences on the economy. I really don't know, but they're good and responsible to protect those who have the most vulnerability. So with all that being said, if you are in the situation where you are now at home with kids and you have to do your work from home, that might present a bit of a problem. And I completely understand that. Now, as a mom who has been working from home for the last four years, I do have a little bit to share on the topic. Now, as of right now, Luke is home with me from his job. And so we do this together. We do the business and the kids and we divide and conquer. And it makes my life a lot easier. But it hasn't always been that way. It's been that way for about a year and a half, but there was about two years where I was working really hard on a business while home with four kids and then five kids. And that is challenging. The biggest thing that I have learned, and I've learned this the hard way, is to separate time for kids and time for work. I have tried so many times. In fact, I still, I still do this to this day to try to do both at the same time. And the only thing that happens is stress. Now I have found a few different things I can do for work with the kids around and not be completely stressed out. But for the most part, we try to designate hours and do a bit of a block schedule. So for example, the way that our schedule currently goes, and I'll get more into the homeschooling aspect too, because I know if you're if you have been, you know, your kids have been going to school and now they're home, you might be wondering about that as well. So I'll share from our experience. But in the morning, Luke takes the two oldest. They're the ones that are school age. Now, my son, he is seven, so he is technically school age, but we think that he is better suited with the uh, younger boys during the hours that the girls are doing school, mostly because the, he he has a lot of energy and a lot of ideas. I've talked a lot about him before. He's a wonderful child, but he is um, very energetic. He's not the one that's just going to sit there and listen to a book. I imagine that if he was in school, we'd probably be getting a lot of notes home. And he's not hes not bad, but you understand what I'm saying. So he is better off with my little school downstairs, and it's better that the girls concentrate with Luke. So 8 to 10, I have the four little boys and Luke has the older girls to do homeschool. Now, the way that looked this morning, I have a to-do list a mile long of things I need to tackle for the blog because we spent all day yesterday clearing out the barn for a homestead project that's coming that I'm very excited about. But I needed to get some stuff done today because it's a rainy day and that I, I added a whole bunch of things to my list because of that. So... During 8 to 10, I picked some of the tasks on my list that I could do with the kids around. So for me, as a blogger, 
This looked like making lunch and recording it for my next What We Eat in a Week video, which is just a, a video I do on my YouTube channel where I show people what I'm cooking. It helps to give people ideas of what to cook. So with a job like that, that's something that you can do with kids because I just shut the kitchen door and the boys were in there with me and I cooked and they made a complete disaster of a mess. So I gave them crayons and paper and by the end of it, they were throwing around lids to my Pyrex dishes. So the, uh, the, the silicone lids as Frisbees and, um, and the crayons were all over. Now, the seven-year-old wasn't. He was coloring and making art like he was supposed to. But there is a two-year-old in the mix. And if you've ever had a two-year-old, you're probably not judging me right now. You probably understand. Now, if you don't yet have a two-year-old, you might be judging me. But I'm telling you, it's harder than it sounds. So the kitchen was destroyed, but we were trapped in there so that I knew that after I made my meal, I could get it all cleaned up. And everything cleans up so much more quickly than you expect. But during that 8 to 10 time, I also did, I had a sponsored post that needed to go out. So I did spend a few minutes at the computer. But that is what I largely try to avoid whenever working from home is doing something that takes a ton of concentration and attention, like making an outline for a podcast or writing a blog post. Those are the kind of things that I don't do during those 8 to 10 hours. Because if I try I'm going to get beyond frustrated that my boys keep interrupting me because they will. And I, I get nothing of value done when I try that. So after eight to 10, usually I will make lunch and maybe, maybe because Luke takes the kids, get an hour of work time and then it's lunch. And then comes the magical golden time of nap. So this is, if you're home with your kids, your husband isn't home with you, and or say that you and your husband both have to work from home and you have the kids and you don't want to rely 100% on TV because, you know, that'll work for a little while, but then they'll get sick of it, you know. This is something that I've been doing since my oldest was born. We have... 12 to, well, the times have varied a little bit, but basically 12.30 or 1 to about 3 or 3.30 is a quiet time in their rooms. Now, sometimes, a lot of times, it ends a little bit earlier than that. I can get, though, typically two solid hours. And if you're a mom who's been forced to work from home, it is amazing, amazing what you can get done in two hours, if you have an uninterrupted two hours and you know you're not getting any more time in that day, you'll get stuff done twice as fast as you ever thought you could. So instituting that afternoon rest time, even if your kids are all older, you just have to tell them that they can go to their rooms and be quiet and I get two hours. This is my two hours and you can do whatever. You can play blocks, you can read books, you can do puzzles. Of course, if they're older and you have a safe neighborhood, send them outside. Just doing that block schedule to me is the only way to get stuff done with kids. Now, my sister, she is still in the trenches of building her blog and she has four kids. So she does this religiously. She has her two hours in the afternoon. She works like a mad woman. And those two hours aren't for cleaning the kitchen. They aren't for anything else. They are for, for what uh, I've heard abbreviated lately as IPC. No, no, that's not right at all. IPA. That's a kind of beer. Basically, income producing activities. And the point of that is when you get those two hours, because you have a strict policy now that there's two hours in the afternoon where mommy can do her work, you have to do the most important tasks. Let's say that your work requires that you put in at least five hours of work time and one of it or two of those hours are times where you really don't have to concentrate you can be a little bit distracted, it's busy work, then save that work for later when your kids are up and around you. But those two hours, make a to-do list. I always have a list. So in my notes app on my phone, I have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then I, I skipped um, I skipped Monday. And I wrote down Saturday. I don't really work on Saturday, but I wrote down some things that we want to accomplish around our house. 
But I always keep a short term list going and then I can choose off of it the most important tasks that I can do when I have uninterrupted time. So right now I am being giving uninterrupted time and my kids are all upstairs. And so recording a podcast is something that I cannot do whenever they're awake. Obviously, it's, I mean, I've, I've tried it. Actually, my last episode, if you heard violin music going in the background, you know that I tried that because my daughter was doing her violin lesson during uh, the nap time hours because that's when her instructor comes. Anyways, This is the time for doing that important task that I can't do any other time, and I ignore everything else on my list. This isn't time to answer emails. It's not time to jump in my Instagram DMs. It's not time to answer back comments. So if you are suddenly in a working from home situation, getting that afternoon time where the kids just know and understand this is how this works, this is mommy's two hours, and consulting your to-do list that you have hopefully made from the day before, the week before, and choosing the only tasks that you can't do with kids to do during those hours. In the block scheduling situation, after the nap time, it's going to be kid time again. Now, I know you're not going to any evening activities because they're all canceled right now, but three to six is whatever you want to do. You can visit my last episode, episode 25, where I talk about some of the things that we're doing to stay busy, but cooking dinner, getting that all prepped, getting the mess cleaned up from, say, Say in this scenario, you did lunch from 12 to 1230 and then it was the nap time. You ignored that kitchen mess. You completely ignored it. You didn't touch it because you know that those two hours are your sacred work time. Now is the time to revisit that mess. The kids can be running around while you're cleaning up the mess. They can help you if they're older. You can get dinner prepped. The goal is that in the hours that aren't the precious work time, you're preparing for the precious work time. So this is something that my sister and I talk about a lot. The mornings are for getting lunch lunch ready, cleaning up the dishes from getting lunch ready, doing laundry, all of those things that can prepare you to have that two hour block. And then when the kitchen's dirty, you revisit it, you prep dinner, you clean up what you can while you're cooking so that right after dinner, it can be bedtime. Now, I'm also a firm believer in early bedtime. It's a little bit harder when your kids are over the age of about seven, but Younger than that, they can go to bed at seven o'clock. Even if it means them sitting, laying in their bed and as they drift off to sleep, listening to an audio book, which is something that we do, that can be another work slot. Now, normally you're probably used to, if this is a scenario where you're thrust into this situation that you weren't in before, normally you can get all of your work done before five o'clock. But now that times are different, you might have to use seven to nine as another two hour surge. And the only way to do that is to spend the after nap, so the three to seven time preparing to get your house, your food, your kids, everything ready to be down so that from seven to nine, you can work on that. Now, of course, if you need more time, you can work till 10. I hate doing that. I like having my break time. But just right there, You can carve out four hours so easily where you've devoted plenty of energy and attention to your kids and to your home and the hours that you needed to. And then you get four hours where they're doing their quiet time and their sleeping time that you can concentrate and probably get done twice as much work just because you know that you only get four hours. Doing that block scheduling is so important. And here's a a really big key which I struggle with, but I'm getting better and I'm able to recognize it. Do not feel guilty for not getting work done during those other hours and know that you're going to put your full attention during those one to three and seven to nine times. And then if you still need more time, so let's say that your job just truly requires more than four devoted hours, you can still not feel bad because this is an unusual situation. These are weird times doing some of the less important tasks while your kids are running around your house being crazy. Maybe this will be times when you don't, if you still have to work and your job requires more, let's not make this the time where you're making sourdough bread and you're making cookies. Throw in simple meals, throw in a chicken and some carrots and call that dinner. Know that your house is going to be a little bit dirty And whenever this is all over, you can deep clean it and you can cook from scratch. But take out anything that doesn't have to be done 
That way you can still enjoy the time with your family. And if you have to answer a few emails while they're running around in those non, non-block non times, that's fine. Don't feel guilty about it because you have to do what you have to do. Another key is don't be afraid to let your kids be bored. I talked about this in my episode in encouraging creativity in kids. This is so important. And I know it's foreign, especially if your kids are used to having school and then some kind of activity after it. Their daylight hours are always very booked up and directed. Don't worry. Their kids, they still have their imaginations fully intact. They'll figure out something. Let them be bored. And they might whine a few days about it because I know when we go through busy times and my kids have you know more TV time or, or things like that, It takes a little bit to adjust back to being bored and using their creative minds, but it can so be done. And it doesn't need to be something that you feel guilty about. Just let them explore and be bored. And trust me, they'll figure out something to do without you. Not everything has to be mom led. I see and nothing wrong with this at all, but I'm seeing so many things go around Facebook where moms are sharing all of these different activities and ways that you can keep your toddler busy. And it requires a big list of items from the store that all just makes my head spin looking at all of the ideas and thinking about having to acquire all of these things and sit my kids down and give them the directions. I'd rather just let my kids loose and be bored and and make their own fun than make these very mom-led activities. Another tip, and I kind of already touched on this, but be realistic in what you expect. This is where I get myself into trouble. I make my to-do list. I have my block schedule But then I somehow think sometimes that I'm going to be able to steal other hours from the day somehow and get more stuff done. This just goes with my achieving personality that I constantly have to fight. But set the expectation during those hours where you're not doing your work that you aren't going to get work done. And with these being unprecedented times, if you have a a job that, you know, you're you're not self-employed, it's not your own business, but you're under a boss, I'm pretty sure that most reasonable people are going to understand the situation that you have right now where your kids are home with you and now you're supposed to work. And I think that most likely they're going to be understanding. So be be realistic. I I still think you can get a lot more done than you think by doing the block schedule and preparing in those hours for that, but don't set yourself up for failure by thinking you're going to do things exactly as you did before with the kids around. Don't think that you're going to work from eight to five and you're going to be able to be productive with them running around because that's that's not real. Let's talk a little bit about homeschooling. This is a a topic that I am passionate about but I often, I often hesitate to share a lot about it on my YouTube, my podcast. I get tons of questions, but I definitely have fear of sharing too much of my personal life with our kids and, and for fear of judgment and all of that kind of stuff because taking the path of homeschooling is, a, is the path less taken. And so they're, you're opening, opening yourself up for criticism right away. But I will share a little bit about our philosophy on it and what you can do with your kids if now you're looking at the possibility of homeschooling now through next fall, possibly. I've heard a lot of schools aren't going to even be going back before the summer. So we are big believers in the unit study approach. This can take on a lot of different forms. But for example, I will share what we've been doing lately. My husband, Luke, mostly handles the homeschool, as I mentioned, and he has been teaching the kids some U.S. history based around relatives. So he had his grandparents both write. He gave them both a notebook and had them write every memory that they could think of. They're both, you know, they're his grandparents. So it's not like they're working and they're both widowed. And this was something fun for them to do. And then Luke based the schooling around that. So they were both born in the thirties. Both of these grandmas I'm referring to, they have tons of awesome stories to share. They both grew up doing cotton picking. They both were share croppers. I mean, Luke could tell you a lot more about this if I could convince him to get on this podcast, but that's probably going to be a little bit difficult to do because this is just not his thing. But 
he takes that and he goes on tangents with it. So he'll get books from the library that have to do with the depression and the dust bowl and something that one of the grandmas mentioned in their stories and he'll read a book on it. And then while he's reading the book on it, they'll mention a state and he will then go to the map and show them the state and he'll just go down these bunny trails as they lead him and cover all of the subjects all based around the 30s but from a very real perspective that is personal to the girls because it's their great grandparents they talk about you know states that we've visited we've even done some field trips to different places that have came up it's not planned out it's not a curriculum but we end up covering the subjects with that approach. Another thing he does is copy work. This is something we learned from Charlotte Mason. So he'll open the Bible and the girls will do their handwriting and study the Bible all at the same time by copying a verse from the Bible. He does a lot of, instead of reading like a textbook, he'll get historical fiction from the library that's from the 30s. And it's just a more relatable way to learn. I know that when I was a kid, I learned about the Dust Bowl, I learned about the Depression, but I can't really tell you that I remember a whole lot from it, even though I was a good student, I got good grades, but it didn't connect with me on a personal level. It was just something that I was, you know, I had to take a test on, so I memorized some things, and I just don't find that to be a very effective way to learn. So getting books that have a story to them, I think are a better way to reach children. We based a lot of this, I read whenever Ruthie was little, I read the, when she was like two, the Charlotte Mason, she wrote some, I think it was three different books, it's been a while, on her philosophy of education, and that's what we based a lot of it around. That's been a while. There are some books that are a lot easier reads than that. But um, looking into the Charlotte Mason method, doing a lot of literature, reading good books is it goes so far. We also utilize YouTube. Luke was telling me that something will come up in a book and then he'll go to YouTube and search something on it and then there's a good video to watch on it, some kind of documentary that somebody has made. And he'll just go down these sidebars and these trails and immerse themselves into the 30s that they're studying right now in a very interesting way. Basing it on family, basing, basing it on something personal. The girls love it. They love school time because they're listening to stories that they can't wait to hear the next chapter. And they're learning from their own grandparents. I'm like, Luke, why didn't I think of that? My grandma is 88. Yes, she's 88. And she's completely lost her memory at this point. I wouldn't be able to ask her these stories and I missed my chance. And I love that he's using that approach. I feel like it's gonna be so much more memorable and they're going to know all about these events in history because of the way that they're learning them. He also, I mentioned this in my Creative Kids podcast, but he will go down side trails and just give them projects. So he, the other day he told them to write a song about the depression. He will do read-alouds at the dinner table about the depression. He uses a very creative approach to homeschooling. It's not all mapped out. And I know for like a type A personality, that might be really stressful. All that really matters is what they retain, not what we push into their heads. And this way connects on such a more personal level that they'll retain something. Of course, libraries now are probably closed. They're closed in my area, but get eBooks. Learn in a way that is fun. Even if your kids want to be in the kitchen with you and homeschool for the last couple of months of, of the school year are learning how to bake from scratch. I think that's a skill that should count as school. If school is preparing you for life in the future, for you to be wise about our past, learning in real life ways and stories and practice is going to to equip kids. And for today's random question from Instagram, if money were no object, which household project would you undertake? Now, the first thing that comes to mind isn't actually in the house. I would probably choose, if, if we're talking money is no object whatsoever, I would want to completely restore our barn. It's from the 1890s, at least we think it is. So it's extremely old. It's actually in pretty sound condition, but it is 130 years old. So there's a lot that needs to be done. It could stand to have a new roof, new flooring in the loft. It could be so awesome. I've seen people take 
barns similar to ours and turn them into wedding venues, but I'm sure they're putting in hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't know, probably something around there. So that would be, if money was no object, would be the barn. But if you're talking household, we probably already did the biggest thing, which is the kitchen. But the next thing I would tackle right away, if it wasn't that we had to save up some money first, would be the attic. We would like to make that into livable space. It's a tall attic. There's a window up there. And it could at least be some kind of cozy bedroom area, which we hope to eventually do. But first, we're getting a new roof on the house. We have to get some insulation up there. So that's a long way off. But obviously, if there were no budget constraints, that would be something that we would take on right away. All right. Well, I hope that I've encouraged you, if nothing else, to give yourself a little bit of grace. Don't get too stressed out if, if you are forced into homeschooling these last couple months or forced into working from home. Don't worry about checking every single box. Just make sure that your kids are learning, being well taken care of, and you are getting a few hours a day or maybe four if you've done the block schedule to focus on what you need to get done. But know that this won't be forever and life will go back to normal. But I hope sharing a little bit of insight into how we do things will help you over these next few months. If you're looking for a super easy meal that can get you through a lot of nights in these next couple months, check out my free skillet ebook. You can get that at farmhouseonboon.com slash sourdough skillet. There are so many different ways you can make it. So you can make the same thing over and over without feeling like you're eating the same thing and it's just something that you can prep ahead of time, perfect for busy days when you're home with kids, homeschooling and trying to get work done. All right, well, thank you so much for listening to this episode and I will see you in episode 27 of the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast.